Hello friends and greetings for the day. Welcome back to another tutorial on ISTQB Specialist, Mobile Application Tester. We are in chapter one talking about mobile world and continuing ahead with the next segment of this chapter that is 1.5, Mobile Application Architecture. As a part of this particular segment, we will be understanding more about how this architecture adds more value or has a constraint being added when it comes to mobile application development as well as testing. And what kind of role does the architecture play in the terms of an application to be tested from a mobile point of view? Of course, the architecture we know from other applications that it plays a vital role in terms of defining the lot of factors including the functional, the non-functional characteristics of an application altogether. Similarly here, when it comes to mobile application as well, you will have all these considered for the architecture as well. Now, there are multiple solutions to designing a mobile application and some of the considerations in choosing a particular architecture or design decision will include the following factors. For example, who are the target audience for whom you are making it, the type of application, support of various mobiles and non-mobile platforms, connectivity needs, data storage needs, connection to the devices including IoT appliances. Now of course, if you see all of these points, each one of them stand for themselves. For example, whom are you making it for? Do they really have certain access to it? Well, will they find it difficult to operate? And the functionality from integration point of view? The type of application, that is that really going to add more value to someone in terms of in interacting with it? Is it like a native? Is it like hybrid or browser-based? Then support various mobile and non-mobile platforms. Connectivity needs, which is again like 2G, 3G, 4G, what sort of connectivity you need. And again, we'll be talking about all these things in more detail in our upcoming slides. Again, architectural decision uh, further includes the client-side architecture, such as thin or fat client, server-side architecture, such as single or multiple tier, or multi-tier architecture, connection types such as Wi-Fi, cellular data, NFC, Bluetooth, and data synchronization methods such as store and forward, push and pull, synchronize and asynchronous communications. So what are these things? Let's understand in a little more detail. When it comes to thick and fat client applications, this may have multiple layer of applications code and may use mobile operating system features. These are typically native or hybrid application. Again, when you talk about the thick or fat client, which generally has multiple layer of the application code, which starts with like in the web services and having a security layer of that, and then you have multiple layer of the web services for different reasons. Could be for the APIs, calling different structures, interacting with the database, trying to interact with third party softwares and many other things. Now this can definitely be more complicated for anyone to work on. And these are typically used for native or hybrid applications where generally it has to work on the mobile app while interacting with hundreds of other features which your mobile generally has, including the sensors, the hardwares, and any other applications, for example, contacts, the camera, and a lot many other things which you want to give access to. Now, the server-side architecture generally includes the following possibilities, which means the single-tier architectures are monolithic and have all servers on the same machine. That's what you call it as a single-tier architecture, where you don't really have to go to multiple locations to access the information or provide those set of access for somebody to start working on. They are less scalable and harder to secure because it's all at one place. If you have access to that, then you have access to everything. So it's just that like, you know, when you have an account in the bank and you do have access or I have your login credential, then I have access to all your savings, the RDs, the FDs and your saving accounts, everything. It's just not that I can only access one part of it. I can access every part of your bank account, including your cards, which is debit and debit credit cards, which are associated with that bank account. When it comes to multi-tier architectures, they are spread server side components across multiple units. Now two-tier architecture in involves separate web and database servers, whereas three-tier architecture also include an application server. Now these multiple tier architecture allows separation of responsibilities, 
provide database specializations and provide better flexibility, scalability and security. Just because it is distributed, you can have security layer at multiple points and of course have different points for accessing them so it is more secure but becomes more fatter and difficult to maintain. However, they may be significantly more expensive to develop, manage and host compared to single tier architectures. But yeah, you need to really understand that if your architecture is all about making sure that is all secured and have a proper uptime and responsiveness, then you can definitely opt for your right architecture at that point of time. Further to add, when it comes to the connectivity, of course, there are various connection methods available for a mobile device and mobile app. A mobile device might be connected to server via connection types such as a Wi-Fi or cellular data connection such as 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G. Mobile applications typically operate in one of the following three modes, and they are never connected apps, which are basically working offline and do not need to be connected to internet at any point of time. A simple calculator is an example of such an app, which really doesn't need or really doesn't worry if you really have internet connection to it or not. Whereas always connected app requires a permanent network connection during the operation, all mobile web app, uh, applications fall into this category, although some can operate in a limited way when partially connected. Because again, if you talk about games, you can of course play some of the games like Candy Crush uh, being offline, but when you want to avail some of the benefits like boosters and other things, you need actually to be connected to internet for that. Or you want to send lives or collect lives from other people, then you need uh, the interface to have the internet connectivity. And then comes the third category, which is partially connected apps, which require a connection for tasks such as data transfer, but can operate for a long period of time without connection as well. So again, Candy Crush is one of the examples for the partially connected, whereas PUBG or other games which are completely on the internet connection to share and work with them, then it really requires you to be connected to the internet all the time to load that. Also to add, when it comes to the synchronous and asynchronous part of it, the synchronization of data between the client and the server can be conducted in following modes. Number one, continuous, which is a mode where the data gets transferred as soon as it is submitted, which is consistent, continuous transfer of data and being syncing. For example, if you really want to back up your WhatsApp to one of those clouds, or you want to back up all your email addresses or emails uh, to a particular cloud, or maybe your pictures, maybe your videos, and you sync up to the Google Cloud, then definitely that's called as a synchronous uh, approach where it is continuous mode and consistently updating as soon as you take a picture. Whereas the other one is store and forward mode is where the data may be stored locally before being transferred, especially when no connectivity is available. Now this is something like your Outlook that you can attach and draft everything and just click on send. If you don't have internet connectivity, the Outlooks will retain your mail staying there for some time. The moment you get connected, the mail will be sent automatically. So this is kind of an asynchronous thing. Whereas the data transfer can be performed in the following two approaches which includes synchronous and asynchronous again, which is synchronous data transfer is performed when the calling function waits for the call function to complete before returning. So again, this is an approach where you generally have a you know, request being sent to the server and uh, the calling function will wait for the called function to complete before returning. So it will just be, you know, having a sequence of thread being performed. The first activity will get completed, then the second activity will push in, and it will be just sequencing in an order like a queue to process it. Whereas asynchronous data transfer is performed when the call server function returns immediately, processes the data in the background, and calls back the cl calling client function once it completes the task. This gives users more control. However, implementing the handshake mechanism increases complexity concerning the availability of the client or the network when the server initiates the callback. So uh, the probability here that you may have lack of interfaces if you lose the internet connectivity or access to the network. Otherwise, this could be again a, one of the benefits of having an asynchronous data transfer where you can actually have uh, multiple you know, times being interacted or knocking the door before you perform certain activities. So you might be, for example, when you do, do make a transfer, though you are logged in and during logging into the bank account, it requires you to 
have uh, login authentication using an OTP or something, one-time password, but still, no matter how many times you make a transfer on the same access or same session, it still prompts you every time with a new OTP, which is the one-time password to transfer the money. So it, it just goes with that one after the other in a sequential thing to be done. Well, so that was all to talk about the mobile application architecture and what kind of contribution does it have to your mobile apps development as well as testing. Now being aware of different architectures will allow you to have the different scenarios to work on such things and come back with your multiple test cases to you know define the quality in the same. So that's all from this particular tutorial team. Should you have anything else, feel free to comment below. I'm always there to address your queries and answer them well. Till then, keep learning, keep exploring, keep understanding the context. Thanks for watching the video team and happy learning.